It was 1856. Workers in now modern-day Pakistan were toiling away when some of them randomly picked up some incredibly old-looking bricks and inconspicuously added them to the road that they were building. Although they did not know it at the time, these workers were holding artifacts from an ancient Indus River Valley civilization, the Harappans, later identified in the 1920s by archaeologists John Marshall, Ernest McKay, and Harold Hargreaves. Historians now believe this civilization to be one of the most technologically advanced of its time, yet we know so little about them, in part because we can't actually read any of their scripts. Attempts have been made to crack this language, known as the Indus Valley language, but none have been successful. You see, this language falls into the category of the 573 extinct languages, languages that no one speaks. In particular, it falls into the subcategory of lost languages, or languages that can no longer be read. Languages like the Minoan Linear A or the Iberian language also fall into this category. It goes without saying that being able to decrypt such languages can tell us more about these ancient civilizations. So why haven't historians and linguists deciphered them yet? Well, the issue fundamentally comes down to two problems lack of data in the form of historical records, and lack of similar language families that we can tie these scripts to. The question I'm curious to learn more about, however, is given that it is 2023, why not try throwing some AI at this problem? I think it's a reasonable ask. We have seen incredible breakthroughs in artificial intelligence applications, particularly this year. Furthermore, we have seen AI prove incredibly helpful in areas where humans struggle, like medical imaging, and for more related tasks, machine translation models are quite good as well. So why isn't there an AI system for decoding these languages? In this video, this is the question we will explore. I'll give a quick breakdown of how most cutting-edge AI models work, and then discuss what efforts are being done in this field, the challenges they face, and why more isn't being done here. I'll timestamp the video, but stick around for it all, since no technical background knowledge is needed. Just basic curiosity should be enough. To understand how artificial intelligence is being employed in deciphering lost languages, it will be helpful to at least have a surface level understanding on how AI slash natural language processing technology works. This is a relatively complex topic, so don't worry if you don't get all this. This overview should definitely not serve as a stand-in for proper tutorials on the subject. For those curious to learn more, I'll link to some resources in the description that I personally find helpful. If you have been up to date with the latest trends in AI, you'll know about a really powerful chatbot that just came out last month, ChatGPT. A core component to this bot is what's called a language model. Simply put, a probabilistic model that generates text by predicting the next token. A token being defined as usually either a word or a character. The simplest versions of such language models are built just by counting how often a token occurs in a body of text in the context of the past n minus one words. We can call these n-gram models. So for example, if we were building a trigram model and our model created the sentence, John speaks English well, we would compute the probability that the word English follows the words John speaks, and we'd also care about the probability that the word well follows the words speaks English. These relatively simple n-gram models can be surprisingly effective, though they are severely limited. In our example, the probability of generating the word well is confined to the context of speaks English, and the model has no knowledge of the words that came beforehand. In probability, we call this concept conditional independence, in that the odds of the model creating the word well is not impacted by the words that came before the word speaks. More complex language models do use machine learning to model the probabilities, where the goal is simply to train a model on a given training data. Typically, the larger the data set, the better. The training works by running an algorithm to iteratively update the values of model parameters until some objective function is maximized. Coming up with the right model and objective function for a task is the challenge that AI researchers and engineers have to face. The current state of the art models use neural networks, which you can just think of as machine learning models with a lot more parameters, in some cases going up to the billions. One common focus area of AI is machine translation, where given an input language, the model predicts its translation. The technology here is a bit more complex than the language model I described earlier, but you can think of it as the same task of predicting output, except this time it's conditioned on a given input and the earlier output. These models consist of two parts, an encoder, which learns the input, and puts it into a certain vector space called an embedding. Think of these embeddings as the computer's mathematical interpretation of the input, in our case, human language. This embedding is then used in the decoder to generate a translation for the input. Many text generation models like BERT only really consist of the encoder portion, and are pretty much trained by having the model predict words within a sentence, hence guessing a word from its context. The bigger problem that plagued researchers here is that oftentimes these models would forget older context due to the limited size of the vector. So 
If we are on the 100th word of a paragraph that's being generated, the model would have forgotten some of the earlier words. A similar problem to what we have observed with the n-gram models. To fix this, researchers have leveraged two techniques, one what's called an LSTM, short for long short-term memory. Pretty much, it's just an addition to the model that lets it learn how much information to forget and retain over the course of the model's training. The other mechanism is what's called attention, which as its name implies, is a mechanism that lets the model decide what prior words deserve more attention at a given point in a sentence. With these mechanisms, some really powerful models have been made, as we've been seeing in society, like with ChatGPT. So how can these language and translation models help us when it comes to decoding lost languages? Well, those embeddings that I mentioned earlier actually can encode a lot of information in them. In fact, good text embeddings properly trained can kind of serve as a universal human language, as they do encode meaning, so words like dog and chien, dog in French, should have very similar embeddings. The same logic can be even applied to sentences and documents, though a lot more data is needed to get good ones. Actually, a popular area of research is what's called probing, where researchers modify these large models to learn what kind of information is being encoded in these vector representations. The results show that these models actually can learn a lot more than just meaning. Embeddings contain many of the grammar rules and linguistic structures that us humans understand. So if we could just get our ancient language encoded into this universal language embedding form, then we'd be able to properly decode them, right? Well, while researchers at Meta have actually found a way to represent low resource languages in the form of these embeddings without needing that much data, the lost languages that we are dealing with simply do not have enough data at all for us to get their proper embeddings. Even worse is the complete lack of any sort of translated text for these languages, you know, the whole problem that we're trying to solve here, which is usually required for machine translation systems. Worse yet is that for languages like Iberian and the Indus River Valley scripts, we don't even know where word begins or ends in these scripts, making translation that much harder. Given these challenges, it's not too surprising that the field of applying AI to deciphering ancient languages is a pretty small niche among the AI research community. In fact, in putting together this video, I found that most papers in this space came out of just one lab, that being the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT, CSAI Lab for short. With their first successful attempt dating back all the way to 2010, before major breakthroughs in neural networks even happened. This is when researchers at MIT developed a statistical model that was able to decode the ancient Semitic language of Ugaritic. In the paper, the authors correctly reasoned that if the language family is known, then one can expect to build a model that can map the characters of a similar language, in their case Hebrew, a known language in the Semitic family, to the not yet decoded language, in this case Ugaritic. Since they are both in the same family, many linguistic features present in Hebrew should also be present in Ugaritic. In summary, by taking in Hebrew as an input and building a model that encodes linguistic features, the authors were able to make an AI for deciphering an extinct language. However, one big shortcoming of this model is that it was built only to work for the translation of Hebrew into Ugaritic, and can't really work for any other language pairs. And that's where the next big breakthrough at MIT's CSAI lab comes in. In the paper with the very fancy title, Neural Decipherment via Minimum Cost Flow from Ugaritic to Linear B, which was published in 2019, the authors built on the prior approach of using a known language in the same family to decipher an unknown one. Unlike the prior approach, however, this new model can work for many different language pairs, not just Hebrew to Ugaritic. The authors achieved this by encoding four key assumptions that historical linguists have deemed universal about how languages evolve. Assumption one. As these languages are from the same family, they're going to have a lot of cognates. A cognate can be defined as a word that sounds similar to another word in a different language, but both words have the same meaning. Two, these cognate pairs from the known and unknown language will be one-to-one, -one, meaning a word in the known language will only have one cognate in the unknown language and vice versa. Three, on the character level, if the alignment of the characters between the words is similar, then those words should be cognates. Four, the ordering of characters across matching cognates shouldn't change between the lost language and the modern one. To deal with languages that are in the same family but have slightly different scripts, the authors actually convert all the characters into a character embedding, similar to the word embeddings that we saw earlier, but in this case, it's just a universe representation of a character's meaning and sound as opposed to a word. With the assumptions in mind, the model and training is set up like so. Given the set of all words in the lost language, we call it X, and the set of all words in the target language, let's call it Y, as well as 
a set F, which represents the possible alignments between the known language and the lost language. The model is set up by multiplying the value of these alignments by the probability of generating an output word given an input. Both these alignment values and output probabilities are learned by iteratively running a training algorithm. The training algorithm starts by initializing some values for these alignments. The paper calls them flows, and then using this value, trains an LSTM encoder-decoder style neural network model, where given the lost language inputs, the model predicts output one character at a time. Next, using this trained neural network, the algorithm updates the flow values using what's called a min cost flow solver algorithm. For more details on this algorithm and the paper in general, the links will be in the description. The algorithm then goes back to step one and continues to run until the updates to this model no longer lead to improvements in performance. The result of this work shows considerable improvements over the 2010 paper and is also the first successful attempt in using computation to automatically decipher linear B, which the authors get from using Greek as an input to the model. But can this approach really work for languages like Iberian and the Indus River script? No, because this method requires knowing the family of the lost language. Moreover, it requires having an actual list of words in the unknown language. If we miss either one of these, then we can't use this method. And that brings us to the latest breakthrough from the same researchers at the CSAI lab at MIT, which addresses the two aforementioned problems. The authors published their results of this breakthrough in the 2021 paper with the fancy title of Deciphering Undersegment Ancient Scripts Using Phonetic Prior. This paper describes a methodology where given the script of a lost language and the set of all possible words in any known language, the model seeks to match chunks of the unknown script to given vocabulary words of the known script, with the hope that at the end of the training algorithm, most of the unknown script will be matched with some of the known vocab words. Like in the previous papers, the model includes assumptions derived from linguistics. However, some of these assumptions are different and rely on phonetics, aka the study of sounds that humans make. Assumption 1. Similar sounds like g and k rarely change into drastically different sounds like z as a language evolves. 2. Languages keep the same sounds as they evolve, meaning that although languages can die, a given sound almost never disappears from the vocabulary of a new language. 3. Characters of similar words do not change their ordering. For the known language, the algorithm uses a special set of characters called a phoneme set, pretty much symbolic representations of sound. The algorithm then learns the embeddings for these phonemes as well as the embeddings for each character of the lost language. These are actually the only parameters that need to be updated for this model. No neural nets here. Overall, the objective that the algorithm hopes to achieve is to strike a balance between getting good quality matches, having enough matches in the first place, and making sure that sounds are not missing in the set of matches. Since there really isn't a good way to evaluate how good this model can do on lost languages like Iberian, the authors tested it on deciphered languages like Gothic and Ugaritic, and found that the model beats the current state-of-the-art methods for those two. With these results, the authors can confidently say that their model can somewhat decipher parts of a lost script like Iberian. As a secondary utility, this model can actually be used for assessing the closeness of two given languages. So for example, the authors find that Basque, another ancient language that's still being spoken today in Spain, is not that much more related to Iberian than any other modern European language. Overall, this field of using AI in deciphering lost languages does show some promise, though it's still really niche among the NLP research community. In fact, although the MIT Labs 2021 Breakthrough Research did receive some recognition in articles and YouTube videos, according to Google Scholar, their paper was only cited seven times as of the making of this video. Which does make some sense, as AI models grow larger and larger, they require more training data, and tasks that can't make use of lots of data in their solution, like this one, are much trickier to solve and get less attention given the current landscape of AI research. Despite this, I can definitely see historians making use of the MIT CSAI Labs research to help in their deciphering process, but if I were to make a guess, I'd say we're still pretty far off from AI being able to fully decipher lost language in a manner like Google Translate. If you enjoyed this video, or feel like you have learned something from it, I would greatly appreciate you subscribing to this channel. Also, this is my first video on YouTube, so I really welcome any constructive feedback in the comments. And again, thank you all so much for watching this video.